I would like to explore this evening a simple idea. And I'm going to explore it then, once we open up this one idea, I'd like to then see it in essentially four systems. Gnostic, Cynic, Platonic, Stoic. Now I'm going to depart from the usual way of approaching these subjects. And the reason I want to do that is I think an easier way to get into the differences between these is to look at the psychology, not the metaphysics. So I'm just going to bring up one notion called apprehension, apprehensive representation. Now, one of the interesting things about this idea is that you seldom can get two words together, one with 12 and another with 14 letters. So <laughs> I submit to you right from the beginning, we're going to have a profound idea. Now, you all know this. It's just an interesting way of describing this. And what is it? Now, this is the psychology of the mind. Basically, it works with this basic assumption, which you have, everybody here has been taught this, so this is going to be a wonderful class, because now you'll be able to realize that what you've been taught can go by this great twin name, apprehensive representation. Here it is. Here you can see through the magic of art, a tree. And would you not agree, from what we've been taught, it strikes the eye. Then in the eye, it's upside down. And somehow, through the miracle of the mind, it turns it around straight. And where do we experience it? Where is it said that we experience the tree? In the mind sometimes called brain, if you're like that. That is to say that the external world creates an impression on the mind. And if it's vivid, and if it has a certain vivacity to it, then you know there's a resemblance between these two and that's an indication of its truth. To the degree that that impression is weak, shallow, to that degree you don't have a clear perception of the object. From this it follows that after you have several such experiences of things similar, you can then put a name on that similarity, and by heavens you reach the idea of tree. You started with a particular, this one, this particular one. Somehow by seeing the similarity in a class, you then reach the idea of tree. Therefore, this is an idea. If you notice, there's something similar between trees and flowers. And any living thing that takes on an animal form. So from that, then, you can take a look at flowers, right? Beautiful cats. Right? And you can say, ah, something similar to those. What could that be? And someone, of course, comes up to you and says, they're all living. And you go, oh, yes, thank you, thank you. So you then reach the idea of living things that moves from the particular tree, right? Now it includes these things. And now you can say, by good heavens, you know, there are a lot of things that are not living. They equally impress themselves on my mind. This isn't living, right? Ah, there's also non-living. Okay. 
You say, well, look here, is there something that includes both non-living and living? Yeah, 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 there, there, there certainly is. Again, you're finding similarities, and from that you might grasp the idea that there is some underlining thing common to it all, and therefore you get the idea of substance, which of course, as you know, is that which stands under things. Say so everything has a substance, underlining stuff. So I say, but look here, that's substance. Uh, is there anything particularly interesting about him? Is there some quality about it that is most basic? Oh, yes, yes, it's most basic essence. And then a person might then go on and say, well, I'm not sure about that essence. Is that the same thing as you mean as being? And you say, yeah, probably. <laughs> In any case, these are levels of abstraction, it's called. Levels of abstraction that come essentially from your experience based upon the impression they make on your brain. This is classic Stoic philosophy. This is what we're taught in our schools. We're all taught Stoic philosophy. Every school teaches Stoic philosophy. And by that, they always are careful as if they have students about to walk on broken glass they feel a moral imperative to warn them about going beyond anything, any thinking beyond this level. For these, they are called empty abstractions. Because the further you get away from the particular impression, the more you're getting away from the reality that impresses itself upon you. Therefore, these by necessity have to be more remote from your experience, from anyone's experience, and therefore they're abstract, see, abstract. They're taken away. What's taken away is levels of existence until you finally have practically nothing in the end but a name, and you don't know what to put the name on. Therefore, if you want to then communicate the best way to communicate with the greatest degree of truth is to always talk about things that are on this first level, on the level of impressions. If you can match your words to your experience, and if you can have that experience always rooted from sense experience, sense experience, from impressions, then your words will always reflect an experience which is your own, which is your own. In that sense, you can confirm in your own experience the reality of these ideas. And if you establish a mode of conversation and communication with others based upon this, then that is indeed a sound way to communicate. So this then becomes an ideal way of communicating with others. If there's any, dis if there's any difference of opinion about what things are, you must always go back down to the basic impression from which all of these things have emerged. Again, this is good old-fashioned, apprehensive representation from Stoic philosophy. Sir? It's a sensible communication? Yes, it is sensible communication, right. So it won't be any arguments to Through the senses, you can always go back to something that's real, and the real is always particular, and that always impresses it upon you, and therefore, this is a safe use of reason. It's a safe way to look at things. There may be differences from people, but that's simply from the viewpoint that they may have a different viewpoint, and therefore they may pick up things slightly different from the particular vantage point that they're viewing it. So if they view it from here, the sense impression of these likely to make a slightly different, et cetera, et cetera, from every viewpoint. So basically, you see, um, 
This means then you should be able to grasp the essence of things. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean the, 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 the intelligible part of existence. You can then grasp the closer you get to your own most immediate expressions found in your most immediate experience. Now, that means if we can tie in, now I'm going to move a little bit away from this, not too much. Right. Now, if you want now to communicate with another, and you're into this system, right? the thing you want to grasp is you want to describe with as much care and with as much accuracy as you can the actions of man. sometimes called behavior. And if you can capture the actions of man in words, then you're com com communicating to others the most intelligible part of what it is they experience. And you can capture what you are experience of their actions or behavior, and you can communicate that in words, and the closest that matches the actual event, the more you are sure and can be assured that it's true. Ah, uh, one more thing. See. Therefore, you also want to examine, you must examine, a man's words. And what you want to do, if you can see this, you see, is to see whether you can especially study with those people whose actions can be described in words and their own words about whatever it is they say always goes back to particulars and can, be, can express the curious intelligibility of the moment. That's where intelligibility is. It's in the moment, you see. And it's the purpose of man here in his everyday world to be able to act in such a way that other people can describe it, put it into words, and then when I talk about it, you can then compare my words with my actions, my behavior and my actions, and if they fit together, that's integrity. That's integrity. Now, some men's words are obviously better than others, and some men's actions are better than others. In what sense? in the sense that they can reveal something about the man and the world we live in. And these people take on special titles. And these are the sages. These are the poets. And another group of people come in here very soon called leaders of schools, uh, perhaps philosophical schools. For their words are the best. They're the words you want to study. Therefore, if you can then think of someone who you might want to see and to see how they function, see if you can grasp in something that they do some particular intelligibility, and it becomes very clear in the moment. You grab that event, put it into words, and then see whether or not that person's words match continuously those unique situations that are picked up. You put them together, and that's getting close to truth. Oh. Just to help out in my own beautiful handwriting. Too small, but I'll read it. Therefore, you see, the, the words you want to find now are those words that are attributed to sages and poets. You're especially interested in those events in the sages and poets' life that reveal most clearly in antidotes uh, their own intelligibility, their own intelligibility. Now you're going for the intelligibility in the everyday world to the intelligibility within themselves. They're the words worth studying. And this is indeed 
a chart of the principal ideas of Stoicism, you see. First, you study the attributed sayings of the sages, the poets, the founders of different schools. And there's a set of them, and I would urge you sometime, if you have some time, to look at uh, Epicurus, Sectus, Cyrus, the Maximus of Theogenes, and especially Diogenes Laertes, who did the lives of the philosophers. He did 83 of them, and he starts, of course, with the seven sages. But what is it they're trying to do? There's a particular interesting thing they're trying to capture. Our culture and all everything it looks like that we do on advertising, which maps a good deal of what we think and feel, is a mask. Everyone should have a good mask, a persona, a personality. That's our culture. Have a good personality. Wherever you really are, cover it up, hide it up, make it look good, get the right clothes, get the right labels on your, etc and act and behave in such a way and you have a personality. With these people, however, there's a different word and what they're struggling to create is character. And that's what, they're after character. Most important, that means they want to go to one more idea behind this, all right? Patterns, ah, say patterns. You don't want to study someone who just breaks through once in a while and comes out with something intelligible and a fine saying. You want to make sure that a whole pattern of their actions follows a certain model and their words fit it and it reveals the intelligibility of themselves. Then you can say that person has a character. He has character. He's worth studying. A man of character is most important. So then, <clears throat> what do you do with such a person? And how do they teach? <laughs> I like to make the comparison between these people, these are Stoics, and sometimes they take on the form of a cynic. A cynic is just uh, more personalistic in respect to his own philosophy. He doesn't deviate formally from a Stoic. But uh, if you met a monkey who was interested in leading a pack of monkeys, sir, what do you think that monkey might say to make clear to the other monkeys that he, in fact, should lead the pack? I know where the bananas are. Good, good. <laughs> Let's try another one, all right? <laughs> Sir, right? what do you think Theseus said when he returned home, sailing home, and he forgot to put up the black sails, remember? And therefore, since he forgot it, his father died, thinking that his son had lost his life in the in the battle with the Minotaur. Therefore, as he got off the ship and someone told him his father died because of that oversight, he most likely would have said, I guess I'll have to be king. All right. <laughs> Try it. Okay. Same question. Same question. Either one. You got two. <sighs> Whatever emerges quickly, spontaneously, <laughs> reveals your character when you're given such questions. Do they remind you in our own age of certain types of questions that might be asked you? Koans, Buddhist koans. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there's quite a similarity between the two. Now, what do you do then with these? You memorize them. You memorize these patterns, these words. Right? You memorize them. You put them in your head. You internalize them. You go over them again and again and again. Because the belief was, and certainly it's true today, and advertising proves it, that at some point with these antidotes you'll internalize it and then you'll act in view of the very things that you're memorizing. There's a very close relationship, therefore, between what you've been taught, what you internalize, and how you behave. Therefore, there's a whole group of people living at this point from 200 BC, at this point I'm talking about to 200 a AD, where what they want to do is model themselves of the characters of their choice. Ah, the models. They get models. Ideals. Ideals. Well, obviously there's a great chance there for rhetoric to come and play a major role, which it did at this time. 
The, the schools of rhetoric were very famous at this time. Uh, there's a well-known school in Tyre that St. Paul attended. Um, there are several great school, uh, pardon me, several great thinkers who were reported to have lived in the town of Gardara at the time of Jesus, which was a famous school of rhetoric where they taught this kind of thing. And most especially, they taught something which I think was most interesting. You must find the right words, see, you must find the right words for the right speech to impress the person so that they in turn will internalize it and they will act in conformity with what it is. Models, behavior. And this, of course, is the uh, ideal of rhetoric. Turning speech into character. That then brings a certain lifestyle appropriate to it. Now, Seneca is the chap I enjoy of all of these people, and you'll soon see why. Seneca was very worried about this, first, second century. He said, you must always be careful about what you reproduce in yourself, because you'll become like the author of whatever, whoever it is that you're memorizing. Therefore, he had great cautions about this. He said, what you must do is that you must always make sure it's the appropriate, the proper sage, the proper words. Even though they are very cleverly constructed, you must be very careful because they are going to then bring about a change in your character and accordingly you'll act in view of that and therefore you should be very careful about who you choose as your model and the words you use. Now, this internalizing, of course, is the great game in the Greek world. This is ethos. This is ethos. Right? Culturalization, right? This is what you do. This is how you generate men. This is how you generate an ideal. That ideal then is able to bring into existence the best of the words, the best of the, of the actions that people are said to have performed or involved in. You bring them together. Many schools existed at this time for this primary purpose. This is really the culturalization of early period that we're talking about now. What is it? This is the psychology. This is basically a psychology of the Stoic. This is what it is. Now, There's a problem here. Let's look at the problem. Another group of thinkers came along and said, you can never in principle ever solve this problem. Once you assume this, you're caught in a bind because you're raising a puzzle which you can never resolve because the premise you're proceeding by is in principle incapable of solution. You cannot solve this particular problem. What's the problem? The problem is resemblance. How can you in any way be sure that there's a resemblance between the image you have in your mind and the objects in the external world? How can you be sure of that? You can't touch it because that's nothing other than a message going to the brain. This is really saying man is an ego in a bag of skin. Tightly wrapped, there is no exit. No exit. You can't get out of your mind. You can't get out of your mind to see anything. You can't confirm that these are similar. There's no way you can determine that there's any resemblance between these two. What's worse than that is that this view holds to this notion, and it's a very, very fine notion, and you can generate a very beautiful question out of it. If this is true, if there is a resemblance between these two, and you experience things in your mind, or in your brain, some people like brain, 
though you don't hear in the ear, you hear in the mind, you don't hear in the brain, but let's leave that. This is primarily the problem of the fact that if you're making a claim that you experience these things, an impression of these things in your mind, then if you look at this blackboard, you know that there's a boundary around it. You know if there's a picture, that there's a boundary around the picture. If there's a fish bowl that has some fish in it, you know if you see the fish, you also see the water in the bowl. If you make the claim that you see something in something, then you should have a separate perception of this and have a clear perception that these things are in it. And therefore everybody here should therefore be able to come in immediate contact with your own mind. Uh, this is the basic problem with this kind of psychology. It's the basic problem of Stoic philosophy. And in the modern age, this came back with David Hume and empiricists. This is basically the empiricist dilemma, as it's sometimes called. Empiricists, David Hume, Stoics, they all agree to one thing. Thou shalt not go beyond apprehensive representation. You should never go beyond the impression created in the mind. For the further you go, you're going into empty abstractions. Huh. Now, how does this relate to Q? How does this relate to Thomas, the Gospel of Thomas? Thomas and Q emerged very clearly. You can look at the doctrine of Q, and Q, as you probably know, are the sayings of Jesus. An analysis shows that those sayings of Jesus can be, by a very interesting and careful argument, to predate any of the Gospels, especially the Gospel of Mark, which is, depending upon who you read, somewhere between 70 and the end of the century. Usually 75, by the way. The, therefore, the dates of the sayings of Jesus are said to be approximately 50 A.D. These are the primary historical statements, this is what historians point to, as the kinds of sayings which were passed around by a group of people called the early Christians and kept alive until Mark incorporated, uh, until part uh, Matthew and Luke incorporated them into their Gospels. All of the sayings of Jesus found in Q have, first of all, an interesting quality. The same statements with the minor variations in, in phraseology are found in Matthew and Luke, both. What can we say about these sayings of Jesus, which are dated somewhere around 50 and precede all of the Gospels of uh, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, of course, we can say that they are the very kinds of statements which are regarded by people in that age as being ideal expressions of sages who confront various people and what they're doing in the moment, challenge them, and in that challenge make them then turn upon themselves and face the predicament of their lives. Not lectures, pithy statements, antidotes, and most especially in antidotes, uh, they, they want to give them in such a way that it's appropriate to the situation, the individual situation, so the person is drawn into it. They can then see in the antidote their own condition. 
They can then challenge the person to respond, and in that very way of responding, they then see the poverty of their own thought, and that should bring them about to a more elevated way of looking at things. Therefore, it is now said by the people who spend a good deal of time on this, that the sayings of Jesus and the character, remember character, what we're saying about character now, the character of Jesus and the sayings of Jesus are very, have a very close relationship to the cynic philosophers. Now, a cynic philosopher, just to change, right, the cynic philosopher has the same view as the Stoics, the way he's doing it that's different. The cynic philosopher is very much like in some sense in the Indian tradition, a sannyasin. He disowned families, has no relationships, he's a wanderer. He goes around from village to village teaching in this very style that we've outlined here, confrontational, he meets people, demanding of them some inner integrity. That's the goal of it. The sayings of Jesus, therefore, of the Q, these are called Q statements now, have no reference to resurrection, no resurrection, no crucifixion, no transfiguration, No trial, no passion. Passion, of course, is the trial, the arrest, right? Uh, the, the arrest, the trial, and the crucifixion. Right? It has making no claim at all of this material. It has none of this, and in that respect, it's closer to Mark. The early Gospel of Mark ends at 16.8 according to the Tischendorf finding in the uh, St. Catherine's Monastery in Syria, and also in the Codex uh, Vaticanitis that was found in the Vatican. They didn't know they had it. It was found in the, four, in the 15th century. Someone said, good heavens, you know what we have back here? We have a Bible in it. Said, really? Oh, yes. Looks low, rather old. And so we, how did it get there? No one knew how it got there. In any case, that very old Bible, and we're talking now about Bibles of 325 A.D. The Bibles of 325 in that period, especially the ones now we want to talk about, which is Mark, and then we'll talk about Matthew in a minute. But Mark end at 16.8. 16.8, therefore, means that there's no mention at all of the resurrection. It just ends at the cave, at the tomb. And therefore, that's very good evidence by all kinds of people. You can look at it yourself that the next 12 lines were added several hundred years later. Therefore, it picks up quite a bit of interesting things similar to uh, Q. Now, therefore, these men were like sannyasins. They moved from town to town. They wouldn't stay overnight. They'd visit people. They'd be very brief. They'd give talks. And they were considered to be wandering holy men. That's what the cynic philosophers were in those days. Therefore, there's a very close relationship between the image of Jesus as portrayed and cynic philosophers of that age. Now, one of the most well, perhaps fundamental books that you must get is this fine book by the Gospel of Thomas by Harold Bl uh, Martin, Marvin Mayer, excuse me. Uh, Bloom to the introduction. Now, in this work is the Gospel of Thomas, very fine work. And the Gospel of Thomas goes along with this, except on this one most interesting issue. The issue that separates nearly all these thinkers from Platonists is this curious word, light. This is what separates them. And I'd like to see if I can make a transition to this most mysterious word. We'll take out apprehensive, take out the characters, and do this. When man experiences the world,
and makes judgments about it as he proceeds into higher and higher, higher classes. Remember, tree, living things, right, from beyond living things in the sense of vitality. Right? We were going into what are called abstractions. For the Platonist, what you're really doing is your mind is getting in touch with a set of ideas, capital I, and to that degree, you're participating in a realm of ideas. You're not experiencing in your head or in your mind anything. There's nothing in there but cells. Right? You're not there. People can look into the TV machine to look for the images, and it's likely not to be there for some reason, even though they emerge from them. Is that true? Well, where do they come from? In some way, that machine must participate in something, and the brain or the machine is just a vehicle through which those are registered and communicated. Same thing here in the realm of the mind. For the Platonist, the mind participates directly. There's a participation into the realm of ideas. Those ideas are nothing other than mind. Better word for mind, the intelligible. The ideas, therefore, can be hierarchically arranged. The ideas that are unities of other ideas, when you finally get to that idea, which is the idea of all ideas brought together into a unity, that idea of all ideas is nothing other than the idea in the mind of God, of all creation. The idea of all ideas is the idea in the mind of God that brought about the entire creation. Right. Therefore, that one idea, which God must have had in the creation of the universe, he contemplated on his own idea, used that as a model, and with the skill of a craftsman, as it were, created the entire universe. Therefore, the idea itself is a whole. It contains within it everything that was, is, and will be as a simultaneous whole. It's not divided into present, past, and future, for those are the separations into progression. Therefore, a simultaneous whole, this idea, therefore, any simultaneous whole that contains within itself the highest expression of the whole is what is called eternity. For eternity is a simultaneous whole. Therefore, the basic idea in the mind of God, one idea, is that whole of all wholes, which then is experienced as eternity. Right, that's the idea of eternity. And all of the ideas within that class are eternal. But to experience that idea directly, to experience that idea directly, To experience this idea directly is the experience of beauty, beauty itself. Now, how is it experienced if it is an experience of beauty? Because beauty is the name of something. Beauty is the name of something. What is that thing about which you are calling beauty? It is a divine luminosity. In that divine luminosity, which is beauty itself, because there's nothing that can be, can be even imagined to be more beautiful than that, one grasps, therefore, the nature of reality, ultimate reality. One recognizes that it is no different than mind or intelligibility, I'll call mind. It is a living vitality. It's the source of all vitality. And since it is the very nature of reality, another word for that is being. Therefore, to encounter this directly, one is overcome with a vast sea, as it were, of beauty itself, where you're not different from it. That's another way of talking about the idea in the mind of God. This is the idea of all ideas. 
Another way of putting that is to say that any time you're working on something and you come to an insight into anything that you're doing, that moment of insight, that moment of insight and intuition can be deepened and broadened depending upon the subject matter that you're in. If it finally includes yourself on the highest level, then in that moment of insight, you recognize, do you not, you're able to stay there. So you're able to endure this. That experience of insight is what mind is experienced as in this experience. Therefore, in that experience, you know it's mind because in, pure, in this pure sense, mind is nothing other than a pure intuition into the nature of reality. To have the experience of a true insight into the nature of reality, you must therefore recognize that reality is not dead, but is the very source of vitality. And that very source of vitality then is disclosed as nothing else, is what is, what is most preeminently real. Well, this is Platonic thought. See, this is Platonic thought. Now, a war occurs over this. A great struggle occurs over this. People don't want to admit this. No, 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 it can't be. No, 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 it can't be. Let's change it. Let's change it. So what do they do? Well, the first thing to do is you have to take the idea of light and this whole idea because this divine beauty is a divine luminosity. That's the experience of divine luminosity. You have to, you have to see it in opposition. You have to see it as an, an opposition. Light and dark. Therefore, man has descended into this body and the body is dark <clears throat> right, and obscures our vision and we're captured in it and it's a jail-like structure. We're imprisoned and we seek to get out of our prison into the light and therefore there's a vast struggle going on here. If you personify the forces that are holding us back, personify both, then you get an evil power over here, and over here you get a good one. Forces of light against forces of darkness. If you do that, you're taking this idea of the struggle and polarizing it. When you polarize it, you turn it into opposites. When you turn it into opposites, then you find yourself in that struggle within your own soul. A war within yourself. Mirroring the cosmic struggle outside. The reason we suffer so much in this world is because of apprehensive representation. We experience everything in our minds. We're separate and solitary. We're caught in this cell. Over here, no cell. No boundary because you know what? Here, the Platonists would say, I appreciate your thought that perhaps you do experience all this in the mind. Would you mind pointing out right now where the mind is? You do experience things in the mind, don't you? That's what I've been taught. And if so, should we not, like right now, what are you looking at? You. No, where? Out there. Where? Right there. No. You've been taught what? That it's in here. That's right. Hi, what's moving? Mama. What's moving? <laughs> what's moving? Um. What's moving? Everything is moving. Oh, no, not, not, not this. How about this? Is your this hand, moving? Your hand is moving. What, is it my hand? Where do you experience it? Where do you experience this? In my mind. Therefore, what's moving? My mind is moving. Thank you. It's in your mind right now. You're looking at me. What are you looking at now? You're looking at your mind then, aren't you? Right now, you're yeah. looking at my mind. Huh? Good. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm in your mind, right? I'm in your mind, right? No wonder this is a weird evening. Where are, what's in your mind? 
<laughs> right? Right? While you're looking at me, can you quickly look over at the boundary and see whether you can see the edge of the mind? I mean, you are taught that you're experiencing things in your mind. Yeah. If it's in it, shouldn't you know the boundary? Yeah. Like, well, I should at least be able to look around in there. Yeah. It's kind of hard. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is, it is, it is. Look here. If you accept this, you see, then you're divorced from reality. You're separated from reality. You're caught in a vast struggle between opposing forces. This is Gnostic thought. This is Gnostic thought. It's taking this idea, dropping it one more level. If you take Gnostic thought, all right, eliminate the war, between good and evil, but build on this apprehensive, pardon me, apprehensive representation as the basis for your thinking, then you're a Stoic. If you carry a little backpack and go from town to town giving antidotes, you're a cynic. Have you ever seen it? In Platonism? No, no. Have you ever seen that struggle? Um, well, I've experienced both conditions. Yeah, okay. This idea that this represents reality is a Gnostic idea. Mm -hmm. If you're asking, is this in Plato? No, it's not in Plato. Hmm. When you deify this, you deify this, then this becomes Satan. This becomes the angel of light, however you want to put it. That's, this is, this then enters into Christianity, is the war between Satan and uh, Jesus. Therefore, it has a Gnostic parallel. Its thought is Stoic. It expresses itself as a cynic philosophers in that age. And that's the way in which it carries this struggle aloft. But See, what's happened in history is that our culture allows Christianity and all of the various forms of Christianity, or I should say of Gnostic dualism, because these are two at war. We allow this Gnostic dualism. We support it in a variety of ways. We enjoy the cynic type philosophers. They've just come back in a very dignified form in the 1960s by the great sage uh, Dharma Bums, Jack Kerouac, right? And to some degree, uh, I'll not be a little more cautious. I was going to say Gary Schneider, but uh, uh, that wouldn't be fair. Okay. But basically, in that mode. And if they then drive bikes, then they're immediately familiar and they carry all the symbols of this dualism. Do they not? Skulls, heads, black leather, and things of that nature. And they're agnostic dualists and they drive around carrying out skull head threats. The Nazi movement as a whole movement was a, established in this agnostic <laughs> dualism. But they all agree to one thing. Don't teach this. Close your mind to this. So therefore, what we have, you see, in our culture, we have what might be regarded as a kind of a war. Everybody in our culture, public education, is taught Stoic philosophy. They root you in Stoic psychology. They urge you to stay in the sciences and keep on particular things, and that's where the intelligibility of things can be found. And therefore, it creates the kind of struggle that finds its expression, expression during crises into this. But this you have to learn on your own. This you have to learn on your own. How about if you see the struggle as Maya, as a game that you're playing, the persona as a game, mm -hmm. which, I mean, if oh, I yeah. play chess with you, oh. 
Sure. And you know, for a moment, I mean, the game yeah. is fun, and we're you know, it, it isn't real, and wow. yet it is real. Because yeah, there's no doubt about the fact that there is a struggle here too, but it's a struggle between wisdom and ignorance, not between. See, when you deify these forces, deify them, characterize them as opposites, and then have them at war with one another, that's different than looking at. at See, the, the problem with Platonic thought is very simple, and that is there, there, there isn't any evil. There's a deprivation of, of good, there, right? It's a denial to the degree to which one doesn't grasp the good, then that deprivation leads you in ignorance. That's what it is. It's a battle between ignorance and knowledge. It isn't the, the, there isn't a personified force of evil because all men, one way or the other, seek the good. Whatever it is they desire, they desire it because they see it as good. They don't consciously desire it because it's evil. They only desire it because they think it may return to them some benefit that may enhance their own existence. So uh, in the Gnostic tradition, it's uh, deification of these forces? Well, have you had anybody knock on your door recently? <laughs> and tell you about... Now is the time to repent because the time is at hand. The world is going to come to an end. It's a war between God and the devil and the serpent. Yeah, and I didn't. I Satan. Didn't know that's that that that's all Gnostic. Gnostic. That's all Gnostic. Yeah. Isn't so. it also a big thing between matter and you know that duality? The fact that yes. matter was created by a demiurge, you know, and um. the whole attitude towards. Yes, some people hold that view, but if you read the Timaeus, you'll find out that the basic eule, the stuff of this, is really brilliant. It's gold-like. That's what it is. It's gold-like. It sparkles. It's radiant. It's our, it's our identification with our perceptions that obscures the light. Our beliefs control the flow of light. False beliefs about the nature of reality is what obscures all this. So, I would like to, uh, with this now, show you, now we're also saying that this Gnostic dualism is most principally in Thomas, Gospel of Thomas, the, Dida, the Didymos, right, the Didymos, the twin, Thomas is called the twin, because Thomas was said to be the twin of Jesus. And that's the name they give him, Thomas Didymos. Right? Is that curious that, the, that Jesus had a twin brother? Okay, okay. okay. I do. I find it very interesting. Okay. So I don't know. This sounds like a. I don't know. I don't, I don't like this dark light stuff, but you say that this Gospel of Thomas is a good book to get? And it, it's and one it, of the 83 reflects. books I recommend. <laughs> I thought Lucifer was supposed to be the twin. That, that's another name for this guy over here, Satan. Sometimes he yeah, takes on the form of Lucifer. That's right. In some Gnostic traditions, yeah. Lucifer is the twin brother of Jesus. Yeah, that's, uh, that's another Gnostic tradition. You're quite right. And that fits this dualism and this yeah. war between the two. And you're wondering if it has these elements, then why am I recommending it, I presume. Is that right? Well, because I can recommend it because the, the major reason is that to understand our predicament, mm -hmm. you have to understand our past in some way, and you have to see that there's been a war against this kind of thought for many, many hundreds of years. And even though we have great books that explore this and can benefit man, this is what our culture teaches, these two. I have a couple of quotes I think I like that. Uh, Jesus said, I'm the light. See, I am the, the light. That is over all things. See, wherever you get the personification of light in a person, that's Gnostic. I am all. For me has all come forth, and to me all has reached. Split a piece of wood, I'm there. Lift up the stone, you'll find me there. Um. J. 
Jesus said, uh, two will rest on a couch. One will die, one will live. Salome said, uh, who are you, mister? You have climbed into my couch and eaten from my table as if you are from someone. Jesus says to her, I'm the one who comes from what is whole. I was given the things of my father. I am your follower. For this reason I say that if one is whole, one will be filled with light. But if one is divided, one will be filled with darkness. Darkness and light back and forth. I disclose my mysteries to those who are worthy of my mysteries. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. <laughs> yeah. There are always, a good number of them are enigmatic, perplexing, challenging, things to walk around. Struggle, right and left, light and dark, life and death. Yeah, 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 the great struggles. Now, um, I have one, a couple more, just to help you. Ah, there's 40. I should num number them. The first one um, was 77. Um, then I read 61. This is 40, 46. Jesus said, from Adam to John the Baptist, among those born of women, no one is so much greater than John the Baptist that the person's eyes should not be averted. But I have said that whoever among you becomes a child will know the kingdom and will become greater than John. For Jesus says, a person cannot mount two horses or bend two bows, and a servant cannot serve two masters. Or that servant will honor the one and offend the other. No person drinks aged wine and immediately desires to drink new wine. No, new wine is not poured into aged wine skins or they might break. And the aged wine is not poured into new wine skins or it might get spoil. Old patch is not sewn into a new garment for there will be a tear. Right? Two, 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 two. Opposed? Right? Yeah. Now, uh, 46, 46, here is the 46. Um, I can give you, uh, 111 is equally uh, uh, interesting. Let me. But that, that one sounded just like the story in the New Testament. In the New Mark. Testament is based on Q. Oh, this is Q. Oh. This is Q. But Mark, that's in Mark, yes. that story. Yes, Mark <laughs> seems to have used Q in a way totally different that's than Matthew right. and Luke. That's right. You think Thomas is Q? Well, that, that, this, this is, is all Q. Thomas. Everything I'm reading is from right. Thomas. And you're saying Thomas is Q? Do I think Thomas is? Q, you said? It is. That's what they call Q. Okay. No, no, wait a minute. No, no, excuse me. No, Q are the sayings of Jesus. Right. Right. The Gospel of Thomas was found in the Nag Hammadi know, Library. Know, no, that's yeah, why you, yeah, you yeah. Did I say that? Oh, thank you for yeah. correcting me. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I slip every once in a while. Jesus said, "The heavens and the earth will roll up in your presence, and whoever is living uh, from the living will not see death." Does not Jesus say, "Whoever has found oneself or that person, the world is not worthy." Jesus said, damn the flesh that depends on the soul, damn the soul that depends on the flesh. The heavens and earth will roll up in your presence. Whoever is living from, from the living, that one will not see death. So, that's, uh, uh, so here in the Gospel of Thomas, you also get necessarily, if you can get over here, that's why therefore they have the goal of self-knowledge. Right? They have the goal of illumination. They have many of the same goals of the Platonic world, but they're caught in this opposition and that's the way they express it. So self-knowledge, self-reliance, self-seeing, uh, um, contemplative, or putting up with enigmatic statements are all in the same, same uh, system. 
Now, look here. Let me see if I can now move. Pardon me? Um, the Catholic Church had to make a decision in the early days because there was a vast body of literature available. They opted primarily for Paul. So they center their thinking in Paul. They also settled their thinking in the early days in Matthew, but later they anchor it in Luke. But um, the opposition, that opposition, that dualism is very clear in Catholic literature from this. Um, in Q you don't find that, the early sayings of Jesus. Q goes through three stages that match the historical changes during the age. And that's worth looking at one night, it'll take a little while to do it. But uh, what I'd like to do now though is to take a look at this. See, Europeans, people that have come from a European culture, from 1611 on, were able to get the Bible. Before that period of time, any person caught with an English translation of the Bible, especially in the 15th century, there were many edicts all the way back to the 12th, by the way, but very strongly persecuted in the 15th century. Uh, and the punishment was death. If you were caught with a copy of the New Testament in English, a Wycliffe translation, you were put to death. Therefore, the whole Christian development emerged without the benefit of any serious reflection in terms of the basic text of its own existence. It developed, it went through a whole period and changes independent of the text, independent of the Bible, it formed its existence primarily through historical crises and councils of the church and pope edicts and things of that nature. Now that the Bible now is available in English from the King James, there is a shock because people now want to say, let us have Christianity conform to the Bible. Well, it never was. It wasn't anchored in the text. Church creeds developed Christian thought. That's the problem. What's the problem? The problem is that the people expect that the church to have been guided from the earliest days by a serious reflection on the text. Unfortunately, or fortunately, that's not the case. Now, when this now entered into our history, they thought it had a historical basis. Scholars went in search of the historical study of Jesus. Schweitzer did the psychiatric study of Jesus, a very interesting work indeed, right? Because they want to see whether they can finally come down to what is the essential message of Jesus. This is the great effort, the essential message of Jesus. Well, what has Q done to that and the Nag Hammadi text, including the Gospel of Thomas? It has eliminated this as any it has a seriously eliminated this quest because the earliest text, if the earliest text can be demonstrated to be Q, and if you can't find the basic ideas of Christianity, such as we mentioned before, crucifixion, uh, the passion, uh, the post-Easter scenes or the post-resurrection scenes of Jesus, the Son of God thesis dying on the cross, if you can't anchor that in the earliest text, then these are all additions. But what's more interesting to me is the fact that this continuous reflection on these works has revealed something very interesting, and that is that if you look at the structure of the Gospel of Mark, you can see by comparing the structure of Mark with the description of tragedy in Aristotle that it fits exactly the pattern that he describes in his work on rhetoric. 
If you go to his section on tragedy and the rhetoric, you will find a beautiful description of the, com the composition of a tragedy. You can read Mark with that in mind, and you'll find the five sections carefully laid out in similar language. And he gives the nomenclature to talk about it. Therefore, you might say, the, the great shock that people have in reading the Gospels and what draws them into it is the fact that it's based upon a Greek a Hellenic model. It's a great tragedy. The reason we don't see that it's a great tragedy is because, as we mentioned earlier, there's 12 lines that have been added to it that make the resurrection. What was added to it is the identity of Jesus as the Son of God in the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. At the conclusion of Mark, the centurion says, that is the Son of God. Therefore, there is no mystery. For a Greek tragedy, you have to walk away wondering and puzzled over what's going on. You have to deal with the drama that's going on and being portrayed because you have to walk away and to try to put it together and to try to deal with someone of that kind of character, in the highest sense character, and see whether you can understand the actions and behavior of the people who's represented. However, this idea of the Son of God was added many hundreds of years later, therefore it wasn't there. The idea of the centurion looking at the, at, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus and saying, that is the Son of God, it's no definite article, it's a Son of God. Therefore, when you walk away from that, it still fits the Greek tragedy. Therefore, we have a great work coming into existence, historical existence, called the Gospel of Mark, it fits into the general description of Greek literature. It should be read right alongside of, maybe we can get it back into its early form by taking all the uh, additions and the accretions that have been added to it, and show it as a Greek tragedy right along with Aeschylus. Put it back into the Greek world. Take a look at Hellenic philosophy, Hellenistic philosophy. Take the Christian thought and show it as an expression of a development of Platonic thought, because Gnostic thought and Stoic thought, every one of the major thinkers of the Stoic thought came from the Near East. There are no native Athenians or Hellenes that were Stoics. When you take Platonic thought and you try to popularize it, you're going to have a difficulty with the upper limits that we were just exploring a moment ago. If you try to make it agreeable to the masses or to the average person, you're going to reduce some of that and you're going to develop a stoic philosophy. If you want to keep the ideals but try to personify it, you'll go Gnostic. This is what they did historically. This is what they did historically. Therefore, the goal of Christianity in the modern age is to recognize that it really is a Hellenistic development a very significant Hellenistic development. It should be put back into the model. It should separate itself out from the Hebrew tradition, Jewish tradition, but join it at the point when Ben Serra and Aristobulus come into uh, Hebrew history, Jewish history, which is around 200 uh, BC, just a little bit in that period because they pick up the Neoplatonic, they pick up the Platonic spirit and mold Hellenistic thought and Judaism into a new kind of philosophical unity. It didn't last, but it was very flourishing for a great while. Therefore, if we can take this literature, put it into its historical context, see that Judaism included a Platonic vision we can then see this whole development as a history of philosophy, and that's where it would most shine, and you could see it for what it is. And that way, you can see that the best of our past can be represented when you have a total view of philosophy. When you have a total view of philosophy, you can see it in this way, and therefore I think this is the way it should be taught. Thank you. Let's have some fun and throw some questions around.
Okay, if Mark's writing is like Q, but does not have Q in it, then... No, it, it, there is an argument that can show that he must have been familiar with it, but the, the Q doctrine that was, just, that was incorporated in Matthew and Luke is a very tight representation of Q. It just he picked up the, watch now, Mark picks up the themes of Q and includes them in his writings. He doesn't quote them exactly as Matthew and Luke do. If that helps. I hope. He uses a lot of it. Yes, because um, I, I think the obvious answer uh, for me is the fact that Q is Cynic philosophy, Stoic philosophy. There is nothing esoteric in it. It's public. It's revealed. These cynic philosophers walk through towns and they do their teaching and they open. The Gospel of Mark is inseparable from an esoteric tradition. Right? Jesus turns to his disciples when he's talking about the parables in the Gospel of Mark. They're 32 to 35 parables. And remember when he talks about the meaning of them, he says, I only teach the many with parables, but for you, those that are in the inner circle, I will reveal the mysteries of the, uh, in this case, the uh, sower and the seed and other um, parables. Therefore, he has an esoteric philosophy there. He can't quote Q because Q is all open. Exoteric versus esoteric. Was there a historical Jesus, or are we better off just to forget about that and just look at the drama per se yeah. as a drama? Yeah. yeah. Uh, a good number of very well respected people who spent their lives in this have given up on the historical quest. Because if the earliest work doesn't portray Jesus in terms of the way in which traditionally he is portrayed, so this is sometimes called the problem of authenticity. Here's the problem of authenticity. If you want to make a judgment about what sayings of Jesus are authentic and which are inauthentic, the usual standard is, if it's in Matthew, it's authentic. If it's not, it's not. Well, Matthew is the first gospel. That was the one that was said for many, many years to be the primary gospel. They thought Mark was an abridgment of Matthew for many, many hundreds of years before it was shown it was not true. Have they translated the Codex Sinaiticus into English? Oh, yes. Uh, the, the Greek text has been available since 1879. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Tischendorf found it in 1879 and uh, uh, took it and uh, edited it in a very magnificent way. And it's been available since. 1879, 1880. Yeah, yeah. You don't need you don't need to. The edited text of the New Testament by Alan Alan has sub footnotes to show the deviations from that. So you can do it by inference, or you can get it you can get it uh, through internet, email. Uh, how does the Q text and the Stoic expression? compare to Maccabees' thesis that Jesus fit um, the traditional education of the Pharisee or the traditional rabbinical thinking of the time? The traditional rabbinic thinking at the time of the Maccabees was Hellenistic. The whole development of the rabbi and the student, that whole tradition came out of the Hellenistic influence in the uh, so fourth that's, century. That's, yeah, yeah. But remember the Maccabees, the writing of the Maccabees is in opposition to the Hellenistic culturalization. Well, I guess what I'm I just I mean, it just if, make if you just look at the Q I mean from your your reading of both those texts, if you look at the what you see as a representation of a stoic philosophy, mm -hmm. and to whatever degree you're familiar with the positions of the rabbinical schools at that time. Does it, would it fit um, that? The most, I think, there are several thinkers that really are worth studying. And one is Ben Sira, one is Aristobulus, who lived at that time, and who were really, I would say, very insightful Platonists that were part and parcel of the Hebrew tradition at that time and created quite an impression and uh, development. 
And uh, Ben Sur is the author of a work called Wisdom, which is the Apocrypha. You can get at the back of uh, some of the Gospels, some of the Old Testaments that still have the Apocrypha literature. And uh, Aristobulus's and Eusebius's work, volume three, I think. I think. But s s several places, but in Eusebius. It would be good to have a, a weekend seminar just on those two people so you can contrast the two and you can see it's very profound. That's where the Jewish re reflection comes and says that um, the Torah was the idea in the mind of God at the time of creation. So it's a translation of some of the basic ideas of Judaism into a Neoplatonic or Platonic uh, development and then representing it with the key ideas of Judaism. So it's a very fine piece of work. Yeah. Because the idea of the Stoic give and take is exactly what Maccabee expresses. Maccabees does that, express that. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, to go back to your question. Doing, yes, yeah. that's quite right. Yeah. Yeah, but that's not Ben Sir or, or Stabilis. It's not. No, they're Platonic, and therefore they take a different approach, more lofty, not into rhetoric as such. How about the beginning of John? The very first sentence of John. Ain't our Cain all of us? Yeah. In the beginning was the word? Yeah. With which type of thought is that? Um, I'll give you a quick view of it, but I, I hope it's... Uh, you have to do it yourself, but here. You see, the John, what's called the John Ain Gospel, or the first 22 lines of John, he is said to be the gospel of light. But if you look at the opening lines of, of John, you'll discover, if you read it carefully, that the light that guideth all men is belief. That's the light. John has an interesting problem, you see. In the other gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, there's the transfiguration scene. The transfiguration scene is when Jesus goes up to the mountain and there's a divine uh, luminosity that breaks through and surrounds Jesus and out of that luminosity emerges Moses and Elijah. They have a dialogue. And by the way, if you'd like to have a nice Christian Zen question, I think the fun question would be, fun on the highest level, can you tell us what uh, Moses and Elijah said to Jesus in that dialogue? That's the one I would, that's the one I said. This, by the way, is exactly, if you take the Gospel of Mark, right, which is has 667 verses, and you cut it down the middle, that transfiguration scene is right in the middle. So it's, it's the apex of the development. John ignores that transfiguration scene completely. He takes the idea of light and turns it into belief and faith. The idea of the transfiguration of light, this is called the presence of God. And that's why in Moses, uh, during, during that uh, period where Moses tells the people to build a tabernacle, that's to house the presence of God. And, and in Hebrew, that's a Shekinah. That's the divine presence of God, and that's the female divinity. That's God as a divine being, is the Shekinah, and that's what the tabernacle uh, is meant to signify. Therefore, when Jesus comes down from the mountain and he meets Peter, uh, Peter says, excuse me, um, I'd like to build three tabernacles. Therefore, if there were a Christian who wanted to represent these Gospels, I think they should include in their service three tabernacles, which would be the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of Moses, and the spirit of Elijah. Because that's what this represents. In any case, um, John, when he deals with the whole problem of light, translates this. You see, this word is uh, glory. <laughs> Uh, that's the word they use to describe that. And glory in Greek is doxa. Right? Another word for doxa is, a, is a, uh, of course, opinion, but it's also uh, um, 
an image of, an image of. This is the presence of God, uh, and therefore it can be f said to be a doxa, presence of God. Uh. Now what John does is he takes the idea of light and talks about glory, not in terms of the presence of God this way, but in terms of believing in Jesus. Therefore he has no need for the transfiguration scene. He drops it out of the Gospels and therefore he has a totally different vision of what it is to be a Christian. That means he doesn't want to continue this, this light, the presence of light and the significance of light. He wants to drop it down into the realm of belief. Now, uh, that's a major step. That's, a, that's a, you know, a totally major step because then it's looking for uh, man's spirituality to emerge out of the realm of belief out of doxa. And that's clearly an opposition to a Hellenic view, which is you must get out of the realm of belief and into the intelligible, because belief is doxa, is opinion. And, uh, so if you look at the first 22 lines of it, I think you'll find that this can be said. And if, I'm, if you can't find it, you know, come back and let's look at it together. I may be wrong, but I've looked at it a couple of times. And I think it's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. According to the uh, scenario we've been looking at today, the uh, 12 lines at the end, which include the passion, uh, crucifixion, and the No, no, no. Uh, uh, it, it, it's post-resurrection. It's after the cave experience in the cave. Well, after the yeah, cave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After the cave, then. Um, how was that added? Where did that come from? Well, there is some discussion in the fourth century by some, some uh, that's in print by some, some Christian thinkers, and they argue against it. So we know it must have occurred in that day. I mean, this is well established. Uh, I'm not saying anything that's recent literature or recent scholarship. It's well accepted by nearly all scholars that the last 12 lines have been added that the last 12 lines were added somewhere around the fourth century, late fourth century, that there was some opposition to adding it. Uh, that's well, well established. Do, do they know who added that? There is a theory about who added it, and I, I forgot the guy's name, but I'll give it to you the next time I see it. Yeah, yeah, it's established. It's, there's an argument that, that there's likelihood, an argument in likelihood, that suggests it must have occurred in around uh, that period of time in a certain town during a certain argument. And I can give you that next time I see it. There's a lot of weighty stuff to just tap out of the beginning. Uh, oh, yes. I mean, oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's just very uh, crucial. I mean, there's those whole religions and <laughs> societies set up. Oh, yes. Yeah. Because Mark, you see, was copied, 90% of Mark was copied by Matthew. And so therefore, if it wasn't in Mark, Matthew, who came another 15 years after, um, he adds two post-resurrection scenes, but it was never in Mark. Therefore, it came in the second century. You know, there's very specific accounts of Christ appearing and Thomas uh, putting his hand in his side and, you know, all this dialogue yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. That's he never put the hand in, by the way. That's legend. It's not in the book. It's not in the book. If you go back and take a look at it. But in any case, if you look at each of the appearances of Jesus that are recorded, and the best way to study it is to use a, what's called a synopsis of the four Gospels. So there you can open it up and you can compare the different Gospels right along as you read it and in that way you can make quick comparisons and therefore if you're looking for an idea such as the post-resurrection scenes you can easily find them grouped together and you can take a look. If you were to ask the question of whether or not it takes multiple observers to, to, to uh, assert the existence of someone, if you look at just standard rules for reporting um, you'll find that each one of the appearances is lacking, that there's a mystery about it. It's 
especially in Lou. Right. But you, you can see yourself. If you have any question about it, I'll be glad to go over it with you myself. Uh, as an example, when Jesus appears after, of course, post-resurrection scene, the, all the doors are said to be locked, and Jesus appears right in their midst, and everyone, all the disciples think he's a ghost. How could he get there? Well, that's right. How could he get there? All the doors are locked. How did he suddenly appear in their midst? So the question comes up at that time, not now, but at that time, whether or not the post-resurrection appearances were spiritual and not physical. If Jesus is walking along the road with a couple of people and they don't recognize him for a long walk and then suddenly recognize him, even though they've been talking to him for a long time, uh, does that suggest that there's something else going on other than physical appearances? All of these questions you can look at just by going back into it and looking at it. You know, see, uh, I, we have a culture where we're taught to think critically, we're taught to use our mind, we have some of the greatest schools and buildings and faculties, but then we have different areas that are in isolation and we keep them separate and we insulate ourselves from using our critical faculties on them and therefore we can't bring them together in any unity. And it's time to end it, you know, it's time to say, look, Let's put this, let's understand this, let's put it into a context, let's get the greatest vision that we can have so that we ourselves can match that vision and go on. And not try to defend things that were never defensible. No, that's my, that's what I said. Thank you for your question. Let's see if I can go back over that. There's several points, right? Okay. Um, how is Q? Hume. Oh, David Hume? Yeah, you were talking oh, about Oh, excuse Hume. me. I didn't hear you. I thought oh, you said Q, and I'm saying, oh, what a question. Okay, pardon me. Do it again. How does David Hume? Well, the people that have That's easy. Whatever you're Christian. going to say, whatever you're going to say after this, yeah. I can answer you. Okay, go ahead. I'll okay. tell you why. Because in the beginning of the work and in the end of the work, he says, "Look here, the mind is has very narrow. It's very narrow, and it has very limited abilities, and it's just not fit for the task of reflecting on this higher level. Mm -hmm. And therefore, all questions that have their origin on a level other than sense experience." are simply in, uh, impossible to resolve because the mind isn't up to it. It's basically a limited faculty for David. So and for the Stoics. So is he just throwing out Christianity then? Doesn't even exist. He, he does. By, by the way, he does. He throws out Christianity too. I, I don't know whether the, the right word would be to throw it out, but if you look at the concluding paragraph in his work, I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Seems like have to because his concluding paragraph is if you pick up any book in the library and take a look at it and see whether it has anything to do with number or demonstration, if it doesn't consume it in the flames, I presume the Gospels and the Bible would go into the flames as well as Plato and etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you.